Geophysicists have determined that the Earth is divided into several structurally and chemically distinct units. The continental and oceanic crusts outcrop on the surface. With few exceptions, it is only the Earth's crust that is accessible to direct observation. The rest of the Earth's structure is inferred from indirect geophysical measurements. The mantle lies beneath the crust. The upper mantle is largely composed of silicate minerals such as olivine and enstatite. The lower mantle is composed of more dense oxides such as magnesium silicon perovskite and magnesio wooistite. The central core consists predominantly of metallic iron. The outer core is in a liquid state and is impenetrable by transverse seismic waves produced by earthquakes. The inner core is solid. One of the goals of geophysical research is to understand the deformation of the mantle and to model its evolution. This deformation is of particular importance for processes in the Earth's crust, such as earthquakes and mountain building. Volcanic eruptions, such as this lava fountain from Kilauea in Hawaii, remind us of powerful processes in the interior. One might suppose that the Earth consists of similar liquid material, but in fact, most of the Earth is solid and composed of crystals. Even though it is solid, much of the Earth's matter is itself in a continuous motion, similar to a lava flow, but on a much longer time scale. Within the mantle, large cells of convection are induced by instabilities and driven by temperature and density gradients. This convective flow has been modeled by geophysicists since the early 1960s with increasing sophistication. The models were generally based on the assumption that the mantle consists of viscoplastic material with neither internal structure nor directional properties. In such a system, we might expect seismic waves to propagate uniformly in all directions, like ripples emanating from one point in water. Geophysicists probed the structure of the Earth by analyzing the travel times of seismic waves, which can be determined with the aid of seismograms. At the boundaries of crustal plates, formations known as ridges may exist. In the 1960s, it was observed that seismic waves travel over oceanic ridges with different velocities in different directions. Unlike water waves, seismic wave fronts do not emanate in circular rings. This phenomenon is called anisotropy. This unexpected observation required new theoretical explanations about the structure of the Earth's interior. Earthquake data show that waves parallel to the ridges travel about 5% slower than those perpendicular to the ridges. In this example, the ellipse represents a single wave front at one instant in time. We can map seismic velocity as a function of azimuth and observe maximum wave velocity perpendicular to the ridge and minimum velocity parallel to the ridge. The red dots represent actual velocity data collected from seismic sensors. A unique property of a crystalline solid is its regular internal structure, which has directional or anisotropic properties. In a 1964 paper, Hess interpreted seismic anisotropy as a result of crystal anisotropy proposing that this was attained by the alignment of crystals in the mantle during the convection process. His perception was that intracrystalline slip directions and slip planes would align themselves with macroscopic flow lines and flow planes, much like tree logs align themselves in a stream. It is true that preferred crystal orientations lead to anisotropy, but how crystals reorient during convective flow in a solid medium is much more complicated than Hess had surmised. In this video, we present a model which links microscopic physical processes taking place in single crystals to the macroscopic development of seismic anisotropy during convective flow in the Earth's mantle. Rock samples provide evidence of the link between the microscopic and macroscopic scales. Occasionally, mantle rocks are carried toward the surface and juxtaposed with the crust. Large volumes of mantle material 
may penetrate the crust, yielding samples for geologists to study directly. On the Big Island of Hawaii, we find small fragments of mantle material entrained as inclusions in basaltic lavas. At the base of Mauna Loa, we can observe such olivine-rich inclusions. These rocks presumably originated deep inside the earth and appear light green in the dark basalt lava flow from a recent eruption of the Hualalei volcano. Slow geological strain rates and high lithostatic pressures cause minerals to deform in a fashion similar to ductile metals. A petrographic thin section of this rock, viewed with polarized light, displays a polycrystal of olivine and enstatite. The olivine crystal in the center is divided into subgrains, which is evidence for such deformation. Now let's examine a single olivine crystal on which the crystallographic axes are defined. We know from laboratory experiments that the fastest wave speed is along the A-axis, or 100 direction, and the slowest speed is along the B-axis, or 010 direction. This difference in speed is about 25%. On a microscopic scale, olivine deforms by a process called slip. In olivine, the predominant slip plane is the 010 plane, while the predominant slip direction is 100. Slip consists of the movement of dislocations on slip planes in the lattice under the action of stress. Such dislocations are actually observed in olivine by electron and optical microscopy, as in this image, where the dislocations appear as dark lines. During dislocation movements on a slip plane, an unconstrained crystal changes its shape, but the lattice does not rotate. However, in a compression experiment, for example, the ends of the crystal must remain in contact with the platens. Because of this constraint, the slip plane normal rotates toward the compression direction. In polycrystals, similar constraints imposed by neighbors are responsible for rotations, which lead to the development of preferred orientations. The interplay of deforming single crystals within an aggregate of many grains defines the nature of these constraints. In general, there is a tendency to minimize any mismatch in grain shapes, which is called compatibility and to minimize mismatches in stresses across grain boundaries as required by equilibrium. Metallurgists have developed various theories of polycrystal plasticity that allow us to predict quantitatively the macroscopic flow pattern, the development of preferred orientation, and the anisotropy of properties for a given deformation path based on assumptions about microscopic processes. Ideal models simplify this difficult problem. Upper bound theories, such as Taylor, emphasize compatibility. All grains deform the same amount, assuring that grain boundaries remain intact. Lower bound theories, such as Sachs, emphasize equilibrium. Favorably oriented grains deform first, allowing grains to overlap and gaps to form. While such simple theories have shortcomings, they have been used successfully to model the deformation of rocks composed of halite, calcite, and olivine. For axial compression in olivine, a lower bound calculation predicts that A axes will align perpendicular to the compression direction. This is illustrated by a 100 pole figure generated by a computer simulation, which maps the distribution of A-axes for numerous olivine crystals. In this diagram, pole densities are presented as contours in the same way a topographic map shows elevations. 
We will explain pole figures in more detail in a later part of this video. Indeed, the same pattern is observed in laboratory compression experiments of olivine polycrystals. In simple shear simulations, the A-axes of olivine are inclined relative to the shear plane. With increasing deformation, the pattern of preferred orientation becomes stronger. In contrast to these simple strain histories, in a mantle convection cell, the strain is very heterogeneous. Temperature-driven convection can have two extreme patterns corresponding to lower and higher Rayleigh numbers. If the viscosity is high and the corresponding Rayleigh number is low, heat exchange occurs by conduction, and the thermal distribution is a function only of depth, appearing horizontally layered. If the viscosity is low, heat transfer occurs by convection of material. This corresponds to high Rayleigh number and is the case in the Earth. In this case, there are regions of upwelling where temperatures are high and regions of downwelling where temperatures are depressed. In a high viscosity model, there is essentially no velocity within the material. A map of the velocity field corresponding to a more realistic Rayleigh number illustrates the heterogeneity of deformation in a convection cell. In the model, velocities at the boundary are required to be tangent to it but rocks may slide freely along the boundary. The buoyancy associated with temperature gradients drives the convective flow. As rocks progress through the cell, the deformations vary in intensity and direction, and consequently the strength of the preferred orientation may either increase or decrease. The Earth itself is a more complicated and heterogeneous system than the simplified model presented here. However, this idealized two-dimensional convection pattern serves to illustrate the general features of the development of anisotropy. A rectangular region, 2,900 kilometers deep and 3,000 kilometers long, is considered to contain one convection cell. The upper and lower boundary temperatures are 1,600 and 2,900 Kelvin, respectively. The large cell is divided into two parts. The upper mantle extends to 650 kilometers below the surface. At the upper right, we observe that the mantle is slightly lower beneath the thicker crust than at the upper left. The material in the upper mantle is principally crystalline olivine. In the lower mantle, the major component is magnesium silicon perovskite, which is assumed to be isotropic, that is, showing no directional preference of crystal alignment. The equations that govern this system include conservation of energy, balance of linear momentum, kinematic requirements for compatibility, relations between stress and deformation from polycrystal plasticity, and boundary conditions. To better understand the deformations that take place in the mantle, we explicitly include the anisotropic behavior of the material into a convection model. An Eulerian reference frame is specified, so the mesh remains fixed and rocks flow through it. We solve these equations using the finite element method, which gives approximate numerical solutions for the velocity and temperature distributions. The mechanical response at any point in the mesh is obtained by interrogating an ensemble of crystals, known as an aggregate, in the neighborhood of that point. The volume that comprises the neighborhood typically contains hundreds of crystals. To obtain the aggregate properties, the plastic stiffness or compliance of each crystal is computed and then appropriately averaged. As each crystal itself exhibits anisotropic behavior, the average behavior of the aggregate depends on the distribution of orientations, which is called texture. During deformation, the lattice of each crystal reorients due to the mechanisms by which crystals deform, such as slip. The amount that each crystal reorients depends on its orientation and on the mode of deformation applied to it. This alters the texture displayed by the aggregate. In other words, 
To correctly predict the flow behavior at any point in the mantle, we need to consider the microscopic deformation processes in all single crystals over the whole deformation history. The orientation of the lattice is represented by its crystallographic axes in three dimensions. Three angles, called Euler angles, define a crystal orientation. Two of these angles specify the direction of the OO1 axis. Then the third angle defines the rotation of the 100 axis about the transformed OO1 axis. We choose to track the 100 axes of the crystals and show the spin about this axis using a sailboat glyph. The 100 axis can be thought of as the mast of the boat, while the hull of the boat lies along the 010 axis. Due to crystal symmetry, the boat's hull points in both directions along its heading axis. Therefore, we map the magnitude of the spin about the 100 axis to a color scheme that indicates the same color for each end of the axis, regardless of its direction. We plot the three-dimensional crystallographic axes for a single crystal inside a unit sphere. Do not confuse this microscopic orientation sphere with the geographic Earth sphere. This is simply a visual frame of reference to aid our understanding of axis rotations within a crystal. The colors of the axes allow your eye to follow the crystal as it rotates. The 100 axis is shown in blue, and the 001 axis is green. Since the crystalline structure is symmetric, we represent the two ends of the 100 axis with a pair of identical boats that appear on opposite sides of the sphere. To this representation of a microscopic crystal, we add a map of the macroscopic location of the rock sample as the rock moves along a particular streamline in a mantle convection cell. The convection cell is shown in the upper right. In this example, the rock remains in an intermediate layer not far from the convection cell walls. This path is discretized into 100 time increments, representing a total time of hundreds of millions of years. As the rock moves along the streamline, Plastic deformation causes the lattice of each crystal within the rock to reorient. This is shown by the boats on the sphere moving, rotating, and changing color. Now we show orientations for 200 crystals in the rock sample. Because of symmetry, the projection onto one hemisphere is sufficient to fully describe the orientations. We assume that a phase change from perovskite to olivine takes place along the boundary between the upper and lower mantle, and that the material below that depth has no preferred orientation. Therefore, the texture of the material can be assumed to be fairly uniform and random as the rock goes from the lower to upper mantle, as is shown for increment 1. During upwelling, a strong texture develops as a consequence of the shearing deformation. As the rock approaches the corner of the cell, it changes direction, the sense of shear reverses and the texture weakens. Little change in texture occurs during horizontal spreading, but intense shearing resumes during subduction. As we watch the process again, observe that most of the deformation occurs during the two changes of direction. As the rock approaches the lower half of the cell, the texture becomes more evenly distributed, but does not produce the same pattern as at the start. Traditionally, three-dimensional crystal orientations have been plotted on two-dimensional pole figures. A method preferred for point distributions is the equal area projection method. In equal area projection, each point on the unit hemisphere pivots on a circular arc to a plane tangent to the hemisphere. The radius of each circular arc is the distance from the pivot point 
to the original location of each point on the surface of the hemisphere. Here we highlight the projective arcs for the points which originated on the central parallel of the hemisphere. Both the grid projection and the data may be transformed from a three-dimensional depiction to a two-dimensional plot using the equal area projection method. Since we originally chose to track the A, or 100 crystal axis, this equal area projection is called a 100 pole figure. In our predictions, the pattern of preferred orientation observed along the chosen streamline is inclined to the flow coordinates due to the complex combination of deformation and rotation. In fact, our supercomputer simulations reveal strong gradients of textures within the cell from the streamlines along the walls to the core of the cell. A map of texture in the upper mantle can be constructed by displaying the 100 pole figure corresponding to the centroid of each finite element. We first show this map on a region that includes both the upper and the lower mantle zones drawn to scale. Then we zoom to the upper mantle alone. The vertical scale is exaggerated during this zoom to better utilize the video screen. The preferred orientation pattern is quite complex, varying both laterally and with depth. The origins of this pattern from the circulatory flow in the mantle are better visualized by tracing the evolution of texture along selected streamlines. The textures of three aggregates are shown for streamlines near the cell perimeter midway between the perimeter and the core of the flow pattern, and near the center of the core. In each case, the texture evolves rapidly in regions of high shearing rates during upwelling. The textures then convect horizontally with little change. As material is drawn downward near the right-hand side of the cell, the textures change once again. The features and intensity of the textures depend strongly on the position of the streamline within the cell. We can see that these histories give rise to a layered structure where spreading predominates. In the zones of upwelling and subduction, however, the shearing causes rapid alteration of the textures. The orientation patterns produced during upwelling are asymmetric, contrary to Hess's intuitive assumption that they should align with flow lines. This is similar to orientation patterns observed by Mercier in olivine rocks from the Bay of Islands Ophiolite complex rocks that supposedly originate from the upper mantle. Knowing the preferred crystal orientation throughout a convection cell and the physical properties of single crystals, we can average over the mantle to compute seismic velocities in different directions. Such a calculation gives an azimuthal variation of seismic anisotropy of 6%, just about what is actually observed. To summarize, the approach we have chosen links processes that occur within crystals on the atomic scale to macroscopic dimensions of the size of continents. Under stresses induced by convection, single crystals are deformed by slip. Slip induces crystal rotations. 
The net effect is expressed in the development of preferred orientation, or texture, in mantle rocks. On a large scale, these intracrystalline processes cause deformation of the crust, resulting in macroscopic faults like the San Andreas in California. Unlike a lava flow, which deforms like a viscous paste, the mantle is not a structureless medium. In fact, mantle material inherits the properties of its constituent crystals and displays internal structure and anisotropy. We have depicted an idealized upper mantle, but a similar technique could be used to model convection in a more realistic mantle with compositional heterogeneities and interactions with the crust. Similar methods could also be applied to model tectonic deformation during mountain building in the Earth's crust. Deformation modeling is entering a new state of refinement. By including the complexities of anisotropy and local structural heterogeneity, our model opens the door to a more accurate understanding of the complex behavior of our Earth. Thank you.